Hi, tear down time again. Um, today we've got this. This is an automatic external defibrillator. Um, these are commonly used to provide emergency um, resuscitation of people having heart attacks. The automatic ones like this, basically they analyse the heart rhythm and automatically decide whether or not to um, provide the shock. So these are designed for use by people without you know, full medical training. So these are often um, fitted in ambulances, you can quite often see them in public spaces like train stations for emergency use, save the lives of people that need quick attention, had heart attacks, so it's very important to get to them as, as soon as possible. Comes in a nice rugged case, it's got a nice carrying handle. Um, as you'd expect, very simple controls. Um, you open the lid and that, that's what turns it on. You've just got a few similar indicators telling what the battery life is and just a, a go button. Um, these things typically have voice prompt as well so that they tell you, you know, stick the electrodes to the, the patient and the electrodes show you sort of where, where on the body to stick it. Um, these are obviously a replaceable electrode pack, we just unplug here. Um, so after it's used, these are like one time use um, electrodes. Just taking it out, out of its bag, you see this it's a nice, sort of really rugged, it, it feels like a very solid, rugged case. Because obviously these are designed to be sort of thrown around in ambulances and be, you know, they can't be damaged. The, the, the whole point of this is it's available in an emergency, so you have to know that it's going to work when you need it. Um, there's a space, the battery pack on this is missing. I think I, I picked this up cheap, as, um, sold as 40 on eBay. I think the reason is that um, this particular model, they discontinued support, so you can no longer buy batteries or um, electrodes for it as of um, early 2011. Uh, the battery is a, a non-rechargeable uh, lithium sulfur battery uh, with a five-year life. So obviously these things are going to be deployed all over the place. You can't you know, have something that you need to stick on charge. So it's very important that you know you open the thing, it's ready to go. Um, it also does uh, quite extensive self-testing. Every day it switches itself on and does some internal testing. And once a month it actually fully charges its internal capacitors and then discharges them uh, to make sure it's capable of supplying the amount of power needed to do a, a different relation operation. One interesting thing is on the front, um, this indicator, this is like a flip dot indicator, we'll pull that apart and operate it later, um, but this gives an immediate indication that there's something wrong, so it's red with a cross through it, and this flips to green when it's okay. So obviously for something that's designed to say sit on a wall or be, you, know, you need to be immediately able to see whether it's good or bad, and obviously a lead takes power, you can't have a lead on continuously for a battery powered piece of equipment because it draws too much power. So a flip dot's quite a nice solution because it gives you a, a nice immediate indication of the status. Um, pretty much the only other external things here, there's a, a, a serial port here. Um, this will be for downloading log data because obviously when this thing is working it'll be logging what it's doing, it'll be logging the waveforms, the decisions it's made, when it was used, how many times it's used, that sort of thing. So um, all that data can be downloaded as part of a, uh, just a monitoring program. Um, the battery um, has actually got, in, it's, it's an intelligent battery, um, you've got these four contacts here which is a data link so again the battery can um, provide information about how many times it's been used, what its charge state is, what type of battery it is and I'm sure also just to avoid third party batteries being used because you don't really want to sort of suddenly find you've got some dodgy Chinese battery that's not going to work on a piece of equipment like this. Alright, let's just take a quick look at these electrodes, open them back up. more wire in here. Um, so these, these are the electrodes, they've got sort of sticky pads around the outside, um, conductive yeah, metal, metal sheet and um, some jet conductive gel on here. Um, this one looks, this one's out about four years out of date and you can see there's a bit of corrosion and gunginess around the electrode and the, the gel is actually quite sticky, it's not as wet as I'd expect it to be. Um, one thing these do do, that I think the reason that there's this hole on here, um, looking through some of the documentation I found online, when it's in its pack, obviously those holes provide a resistive path through the electrodes and it uses that to um, check the fact it's plugged in so that it can monitor itself. So for example if somebody steals the electrode pack or they're missing, this thing will start bleeping to say, hey guys, you know, my electrodes, either they've dried out, they're not, they're not um, properly installed all the usual warnings and stuff on the label at the back. Um, explosion has, the reason for that is that some anaesthetics um, are potentially explosive, can produce an explosive atmosphere, so you don't really want to be discharging high voltage things in the presence of those in case of nasty explosion incidents, and obviously hazardous electrical output, well yeah that's what it's supposed to do. Um, I'm assuming that means sort of only use for external defibrillation. 
um, I think this is me, yeah, or trained medical people only, and then it's all the other usual CUL certification marks. Not surprisingly, for a piece of kit like this, it uses uh, security torx screws, which are, have got this little stud in the middle, which means you can't use an ordinary torx driver. Uh, um, you can get, get driver bits for these are readily available, pretty much any decent electronic store. The problem is. Um, although these are fine for um, some screws, a lot of the time you find the screws buried down, down a hole which means you can't get it in. The quick and easy solution is just to cut a slot in the back of the bit like this and then you can just use a standard screwdriver to undo it. Um, the better quality ones of these are made out of hardened steel so it's actually quite difficult to cut with a hacksaw. Uh, the trick for that is just to stick it in a gas flame from a blow lamp or a, a gas hob or something uh, until it's just very dull red. Um, that, that then destroys the hardening, then you just cut it with a hacksaw quite easily. So you can then just drop it in the hole, get your standard flat blade screwdriver, wiggle it around till it makes, and there you go. Right, the first thing you see when you open this up is this big sheet of rubber um, shock protection. Just unplug all this lot. Um, two electro connections. There's a um, couple of lumps of ferrite on the uh, connection as well because obviously the leads are going to act as antennas so you firstly you don't want this thing radiating interference but in particular what you don't want is when this thing's trying to analyse a patient's pulse if a guy's using a two-way radio next to it you really don't want that, that to me mess up the um, measurement so that's to make sure that you don't get interference coming back down the leads into the circuitry that's trying to analyse the heart rhythms. The most obvious feature is these capacitors. Um, I was actually a little bit surprised to see this. Um, I've taken a couple of defibs apart quite a long time ago and they had sort of capacitors more like this. This is um, uh, 28 microfarads at 5300 volt rating. Um, one of the reasons for this is um, older defibrillators pre about 1980s used a single, um, tend to use a single pulse, single polarity. They literally they charge the capacitor up and then discharge that through an inductor to limit the um, rate of rise straight into the patient through a mechanical switch and that was it. After then uh, they started introducing what's called biphasic waveforms. Instead of introducing one single polarity pulse they actually get, pulse it one way and then pulse it in the other direction after about 10 milliseconds and this apparently produces better results and it also allows the use of much lower powers they use about half the energy so it reduces the risk of injury burns and so on but also a side effect it means the defibrillator itself could be smaller so what i'm guessing is these electrolytics they're rated uh, 740 microfarads 450 volts i'm guessing what they do is they probably use ser possibly series and, and parallel combinations to be able to get different voltages because all the switching is now via semiconductors rather than mechanical relay type switches well, in addition to the capacitors which are actually on a lower board, um, there's a top board here which is obviously a processor board. Um, this is this main processor, now this isn't actually, I first thought this was a heatsink but it actually isn't, what this is, this is actually a lump of ferrite because um, this actually sits directly underneath the speaker on the um, top panel which is likely to be act as a bit of an antenna. Um, so I think this is just 3MC to um, prevent the noise radiating up from this through the speaker and also of course to stop noise coming in as well coming into the system. Um, just pulled it off. This is an Intel um, 80C186 so pretty old old tech and this I think it dates from about the year 2000 or so. I'll see if I can find any dates on anything. Uh, like there's a 99 date code there, 19, uh, so 90, another 99, so around the year 2000 or so. So we've got a processor, we've got a crystal oscillator, um, some static RAM, some flash ROM for the software. There's a Dallas real time clock with an internal battery because obviously this thing is going to be logging things and it, and it really wants to know the real time. And just some general other logic, there's RS-232 drivers there, um, a few just various power drivers. There's these are LED drivers for the um, the top panels, a load of LEDs that show the battery status and so on. So this is this fit dot indicator, typically magnetic. There's a, like a, a disc on a rotating um, pivot with a magnet on there and by supplying different polarity to it, it will flip in different directions. And just flip it either way with a, just a coin cell to do its two states. Um, so the nice thing about these is they're very low power, it just needs a little pulse to flip it one way or the other and then it just stays that way. Um, it's the same sort of thing that you occasionally see on things like large message boards at train stations, although they tend to use LEDs or LCDs these days. But it's a nice low power, very high visibility, very high contrast indicator. 
not much to see on the other side of this board, just a few bus buffers, resistors, not much else. It looks like it's um, about a six layer board, you can see quite a lot of traces on a, a secondary layer in there, and there'll probably be some power planes going through the middle. Right, this is the lower board, this looks a lot more interesting, this is where obviously the main functionality um, happens. Obviously you've got this big bunch of capacitors, these are actually marked with the manufacturer's name, um, Survivor Link, whether they manage, I suspect they probably don't manufacture them themselves, they're probably just custom made by a capacitor manufacturer and have their name written on them. There's a lot of this rubber foam stuff everywhere, all around the board, all underneath. Um, again, this is just to make it rugged because this thing can be thrown around, thrown in the back of an ambulance and this is the sort of gear that has to work because literally lives could be at stake. Interesting as well, there's got a little bodge wire on there. Um, but one thing I noticed on this label, there's lots of, it says ECO and then a number, which is engineer and change order. Obviously if you're manufacturing gear like this, you have to have a very strict process in place to um, track any modifications, changes and so on. Um, so although these are actually done with little bits of wire, that you know, all these mods will be recorded and approved and tested and, and so on. Um, quite a lot of the cost of a lot of medical equipment is purely the approvals costs. Um, not to mention insurance, of course. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of uh, quite thick and formal coating, particularly around this area. This is the high voltage area, but also the, the sensitive area for the, um, the analysis side of things. So again, that's to protect against any moisture ingress, because again, this thing will be, could be used in all sorts of environments. It could be hung on a wall in a fairly cold environment, so you could get condensation. So there's a, a quite a big gungy layer of um, conformal coating there. Right, so we've got the, the main capacitors here. There's a separate section, I'm not sure whether they're just using different capacitors here just to make up the capacitance in the size or whether they they actually provide a slightly different function, I don't, I don't really know. Again, there's more foam here. You've got a lot of vertical TO220 package devices here and again this foam stops them wiggling around and rattling about. Um, quite a lot. There's also there's one or two underneath the capacitors as well in, in these little gaps. This little can is going to be the analog front end for all the analysis stuff. Let's pull the lid off that. And again we've got just various analog chips, um, some capacitors, um, this massive great ceramic, I've never seen a surface mount ceramic capacitor that big before, um, there's various inductors again this will be RF filtering and all this will be just analog amplification stuff. This big core, this will be the big DC to DC converter to actually charge the capacitors up to a high voltage. And so all these are going to be switching to um, either switch the charging and also produce the bipolar waveform and so on. This big one, I suspect what this might be, uh, because this thing has the capability to charge itself up and then discharge itself for testing, my guess is this could be a discharge resistor to actually discharge the capacitor so it can monitor the performance. There's a DC to DC converter there, there's a couple of lots of isolators, so I would imagine the high voltage side is probably completely isolated from everything else. Um, so we've got say, its own isolated supply there and auto isolators to send the signals for the um, to tell it what to do. Um, I can't actually see any isolation of the analog voltage, but I mean, there's some two high-value resistors here connecting the potent electrodes to the to the um, low-level stuff. 20k, and they're high, they're sort of quite big, thick film resistors. So the isolation of the the high voltage from the low level is, is probably mostly through that those 20k. And there's obviously going to be some clamping diodes and all that sort of stuff to protect it from when the um, when it delivers the high voltage to stop it blowing up its front end. Yeah, just give you some fine detail here. Again, there's those high voltage resistors. You can see all the conformal coating around those opto isolators. It's a pretty thick, gungy layer. That's inside the analog can. More analog stuff there, inductors, discharge resistor. And that right hand connector is just the connector up to the main processor board. Um, wires in there, they just come from the battery. Uh, this board actually lifts straight out because all this foam padding, it's just padded in, in, into place, it's not actually screwed into the case at all. So this just lifts out. Um, not really much to see on the other side, there's a lot of big diodes. Um, again, this will be to do with the switching and also probably pr to protect the electrolytics against reverse polarity. Um, one thing electrolytics really don't like if you've got a load in series, if you just discharge them you can end up reverse charging some of them, so I'm guessing a lot of these diodes are just to protect against that. 
Looking through some of the information, I'm just wondering if these capacitors are actually a completely separate system because it mentions high and low energy pulses, so it may well be that depending on its analysis of the, the heart, it can decide whether or whether to give a higher or lower energy defibrillation. Because if you look, there's quite a lot of duplication, although you've got the one DC to DC converter here, um, there's a lot of switching components. You've got another one of these big resistors, which I suspect are for a discharge testing. This inductor here, I'm guessing this may be for uh, rise time control. Um, and again, there's for it, there's a bunch of capacitors in one of these coils here, and there's another one of these for this set of capacitors. So I'm just wondering if, um, in fact, this is almost two completely separate circuits that can either deliver a higher or low energy. Um, they can't really use the same magnet capacitors because you need to control the capacitance rather than the voltage because a, a patient is going to have a fairly high resistance. Um, what really matters is how much current it puts through the heart. So the only way really to control that is to have a similar voltage but a different amount of capacitance behind it um, to control that. Uh, these devices here, these are um, Ixis 40M160, 40M160, which I think they're big chunky MOSFETs. Um, it's a bit hard to see because a lot of the high current stuff is rooted on inner layers of the PCB. Um, I'll pull these capacitors off and see if we can see any more. I've right, just taken the caps off and I've backlit the board so it's a bit easy to see what's going on. Um, there's quite a lot of, most of these devices appear to be thyristors, which are a fairly low cost way of switching high currents. Um, a lot of these diodes seem to be connected in series. For example, there's a set of three in series here, there's another set of three in series here. I'm guessing with the way they've done this is that you've got the two capacitor banks and they're just using diodes to switch between the two. So you charge one bank up and then discharge, and it'll discharge whichever bank um, had been charged. Um, not totally sure the reason they've got three diodes. It could be to increase the voltage, but it might also be to, for safety. Um, in that, if you it, it just provides redundancy because diodes tend to fail short. If you get one diode failing short, then maybe the idea is that you've still got two in there providing the protection. Um, that's a technique used for intrinsically safe systems for use in explosive atmospheres. So similar techniques may be being used in medical gear. I don't know enough about medical stuff to to know really. Um, these two MOSFETs, these again, these appear to be wide in series. They're 1600 volt rated. Um, the electrolytics, the main ones, are actually wide in series. You can actually see the the, um, the tracks are connected in the series. So they're each rated 450 volts. They're probably not work, not run at their maximum voltage. So you're probably looking at about 1600 volts or so. So again, it could be these are doubled up to increase the voltage rate. It could be for redundancy. Because I'm guessing these could well be the devices that actually connect the capacitor bank to the patient so you really don't want that going wrong um, could be a bit nasty um, this here is I, I'm pretty certain this is for a discharge testing you've got another thyristor here connected through the, the resistor right. off this front label you can see nothing's really exciting a load of leads poking through the PCB one button this whole thing basically it's got two controls there's the on off switch and there's a little hall effect sensor there that detects when the lid's open. There's a magnet inside the lid so that the thing turns on when it opens up. One last little surprise when I pull this apart. Look at that, 3.2mm thick PCB. I can only assume that's just for mechanical rigidity. I don't think I've ever seen a PCB that thick before. Just goes to show it's always worth tearing it down to the last, last little bit. You never know when there might be something surprising in there. Right, I've traced out the major parts of the circuitry just to get an idea of what was going on. Um, here we've got the main bank of four capacitors. These total up to 185 microfarads, 1800 volts. And here's the smaller bank. Um, this totals 110 off at, at 1350 volts. Again, you can see these um, reversed protection diodes across them. Um, this is this big blue resistor, uh, which is a di there's a couple of th series thyristors to discharge this capacitor. And again, this small bank's got its own discharge resistor and its set of thyristors. Um, each bank goes through this little network. We've got an inductor here. This is going to be to control the rise time of the uh, pulse waveform. Um, I think these diodes are going to be to avoid any reverse kickback uh, through that inductor when the current's turned off. And I'm guessing this resistor is probably also to damp down and control the, um, the wave form. Again you've got serious, another serious, serious thyristor here. Here we can see these sets of triplicated diodes. Here are the two big MOSFETs we've got there. Um, uh, we've got two patient electrodes here. Little patient not looking very well because his heart is in need of a bit of defibrillation. Um, we've got the two 20k resistors. This goes through some protection diodes to the analog processing to me measure the heart characteristics, what's actually going on to 
in order for the system to decide whether or not to give the shock or not. Um, there's this network here, this is this massive great ceramic capacitor here and this is a set of those white resistors that we saw on that the board. Um, they're actually fairly high power 36 ohm resistors, sort of thick film resistors. Um, I'm not quite sure what this is for, I think it's one of two things. Either it's to monitor the actual waveform that's being applied. Um, this is a sort of uh, ferrite cord transformer, it's a little bit bigger than a lot of the other transformers, there's lots of little ferrite cord trigger transformers that are connected to the gates of all these thyristors. Um, I'm not sure whether this would actually have a low enough bandwidth to, to pass the main defibrillation pulse. Um, the other thing it might be to do is to actually monitor the um, connections of the paddles. As we saw in the pack, the paddles are stuck together so that it can actually monitor the fact that they, they're in the pack, they haven't been opened. So it might be this just injects high frequency signal in here to monitor it, either directly sort of through the loading on here or possibly through these um, the, the sensing circuitry. I'm, I'm not totally sure about that. This is some information from the documentation that shows the actual waveform that it applies. You can see there's a uh, positive and a negative section and we'll look at how those, two, those are applied through the actual circuitry. OK, let's take a look at how this circuit actually works. Um, I'm not totally sure about the timing relationships between the firing of the thyristors and the MOSFETs, but the thyristors are turning the current on and then the MOSFETs break the circuit to turn off again because thyristors will turn on and then stay on until the current reduces below their threshold voltages. So the first thing that happens is we get the positive discharge, which is the higher value. Um, this follows the path shown here. And then shortly afterwards, the FETs presumably turn this off, and then the other thyristors fire to produce the discharge in the other direction. And then the FETs turn it off again to turn the system back into a safe state.